The following program may contain subject matter and language suitable for mature audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. And welcome to another uh, hopefully inspiring episode of The Meltdown. His name is Jeff. And his name is Norm. And uh, we are your hosts, and we hope for the next little while to entertain you with some interesting stuff. Today, we are uh, talking about things that work and things that no longer work. It's kind of interesting. We've got some interesting stuff. You're, you're already yawning. <laughs> so, I mean, we've just think... started the show and it's like your, 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 no. your board is. No, your... I'm actually very fascinated. I, I don't know why I just yawned. Yeah. I, lack of oxygen in this warehouse. Maybe <laughs> uh, it's, it's drafty today. <laughs> As you can tell, I, I wore my, uh, yeah. Nice plaid shirt, You're just long sleeves today, <laughs> ah. uh, and as as you are. Well, so that's going to work on camera. The the stripes. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. The, these stripes are fine. Uh, <laughs> just wondering. Sorry to be a director. Of <laughs> no, no. Jeff is alluding to the fact that uh, we shot an episode back in season one, I believe it yeah, was. I think so. I think it was season one, and I wore a blue that just kind of. I don't know, uh, messed up with the green screen, so we ended up having to reshoot the whole thing. Mm. But, you know, uh, it happened for a reason, and it turned out to be a great episode, and uh, so uh, thanks for bringing that up, Jeff. <laughs> okay, let's begin the show today. We've got lots of good stuff for you. We've got some great fun facts. We've got Lou Saracino with another Meltdown Minute with Lou, and we've got some stupid stupidness. So let's get to, what's the first thing we're going to go to, Jeff? Uh, uh, a Meltdown Fun Facts? No. Yeah. Melt oh, okay. <laughs> Meltdown fun facts. Let's start with Meltdown fun facts. All right, so here are 10 amazing old things that still work. And I might just add, there's actually 12. Uh, there's yeah. myself and Jeff. Uh, oh, yeah, we still work. We're still working. I mean, functioning, uh, if, if I can say that. Uh, but let's look at 10 amazing old things that still work. You probably won't believe what you're going to see. Uh, I was fascinated by this. I think you will be, too. First off, we've got the world's oldest light bulb mm. that has been working for 111 years. Take a look at this. Wow. The world's oldest light bulb has been burning for 111 years. So little wonder it has a fan club with thousands of members and its own website. The so-called Centennial Light has been on almost constantly since 1901. It holds pride of place in Fire Station 6 in Livermore, Northern California. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, that's, that's getting value for your money, a light bulb that lasts 111 yeah, years. Yeah, I have to go back to the store. I doubt you could buy one today that will last for 111 years. No, I doubt it. I don't think they're manufactured to last. No. Just my opinion. Yeah. All right, second thing. Uh, this is pretty cool. The world's oldest vacuum cleaner working since 1904. Ooh. Still sucking after 108 <laughs> years, Harry Cox owns the oldest known working vacuum. He rescued the cleaner and accessories from a skip at work before it went to a landfill site. Harry at 53, less than half the age of his 1904 American <laughs> Sturdivant vacuum cleaner number four said, there was a walk-in skip at the factory and I rescued it. Oh, I think it's important to have a vacuum that's much older than you. You know, you kind of, yeah. kind of, kind of look up to it and, and get some grandfatherly or grandmotherly advice. And also, from a vacuum. Yeah, from a vacuum. Yeah. Also keeps your carpets clean. Now, I have in my possession... Mm -hmm. A 1959 mm -hmm. Hofner hollow body six string guitar. Wow, I didn't know that. But this guitar is actually four years older than me. Yeah. So uh, it's it it blows my mind. Wow, cool. Okay, so speaking of other old things that still work, here's a look at an old refrigerator that's been working for 77 years. Ooh. It was the era of the Great Depression, a decade of austerity when household finances were stretched. So when the Kinghorn family bought a new refrigerator in 1936, they hoped it would prove a good investment. 
They could have never imagined that three quarters of a century later, with the nation again facing tough economic times, the fridge would still be working as well as ever. The Frigidaire, a 1935 model, is now a contender for the title of the oldest continuously working refrigerator in the country. It has never needed repairs apart from the occasional replacement part. Oh, I wonder if some of the original food is in the refrigerator. I, I, I bet uh, <laughs> some of the original food is, is and it's probably delicious, uh, probably <laughs> wedding cake or something. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I just I want to take issue with, with that last sentence because mm -hmm. it says it's never needed a repair other than the occasional replacement part. Yeah. Isn't that considered a repair? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of like, like I went outside for a walk, but I didn't go outside or something like that. I mean, it's still <laughs> impressive, but yeah, the occasional repair, you're right. That is it's replacing a repair. the part. Okay, let's take a look at uh, something else that's really old and still works. The oldest working computer, which has been working since 1958. In Japan's Aikida Memorial Hall sits the FACOM 128B that was built in 1958 and still works today. It has gone through some small upgrades over the years to keep it running, but still has the same core system. The FACOM occupies 700 feet of floor space <laughs> and has less calculating power than a real calculator. Oh. The company's goal is to keep it running until the year 2016, when it will have reached its 60th year of operation. So there you go. So there's, there's no other reason to think. I mean, you buy today one of those greeting cards, you know, you open it up and it plays a little song. Yep. There's more computing power in one of those than yeah. there is in this machine. Wow. But uh, I know, and that's just, that's crazy, uh, crazy fact. But, uh, you know, just to keep it running till it turns 60, I wonder then if they'll decide the go for another 40 years. Why not? Yeah, you keep know? it running. 100 yeah. years, that would be kind of cool. The this machine's, this machine's been running for 100 <laughs> years. What can it do? Nothing. Uh, two plus two, <clears throat> two times yeah. two. It can do simple math. Yeah, but it takes about an hour to, yeah, and it right. spits the card two out. Two times at some point. two equals, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> working, working. <laughs> okay, this one I found really fascinating. The oldest humanoid robot built in 1950. He didn't have any intelligence, and he moved with just a slow, lumbering shuffle of his metallic feet. But one of Britain's first humanoid robots, built just after the Second World War, has been given a new lease on life after having languished in a garage for the past 45 years. Former spy catcher and RAF officer Tony Sale, 79, built the incredible six-foot-high robot George in 1950 for just $20, wow. using scrap metal from a crashed Wellington bomber plane. At the time, Mr. Sale was only 19 and his amazing man-sized model, which could walk and talk, stunned the world. Wow. And uh, um, that robot, yeah. to me, is very, very likened to... Um, uh, Robbie the Robot? No, no, uh, Day the Earth Stood Still. Okay. Uh, Gort, the, oh, okay. the big silver robot, mm. the one that uh, mm. had to say Klaatu if you said Klaatu Barada Nikto to it, then it would, uh, it would go yeah. into action. I think this robot also appeared on an episode of Gilligan's Island. Remember the robot episode? Yes, I do. I do. Gilligan. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. It was one of my favorite episodes. Yeah. What can I say? Yes, I watched Gilligan's Island. So what? You got a problem with that? Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, really old stuff that still works. Uh, we've got Britain's oldest TV, which has been working for 75 years. Whoa. For 5,000 pounds, you might have expected a bigger, flatter screen, but this television does come with 75 years of broadcasting history, and you can still hook it up to a Freeview box. I guess that's an, that's an English thing. Nice. Built in 1936, the Marconi Type 702 is the oldest working television set in Britain. It was bought for just under 100 pounds only three weeks after transmissions in Britain began. Wow. And with just one channel broadcasting for two hours a day, there wasn't much need for a remote control. <laughs> Obviously, right? Yeah. It is interesting how television has been around a lot longer, mm -hmm. than, or at least a little longer than people think. You know, most people got their TV sets, you know, Canada, United States, Britain in the 1950s. Right, right. Um, but television, of course, existed uh, long before that. And there were television networks, but... Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let's keep uh, going. Only got a couple of these left. Um, how about the world's oldest traffic light working since 1932? Wow. Despite grumbles from envious rivals, Asheville, Ohio sticks to its claim that it has the world's oldest traffic light. 
The light is now on permanent display inside Ohio's Small Town Museum. The light has never stopped working since 1932, which is when it was installed at the corner of Main and Long Streets. The light looks like a silver Buck Rogers era football and operates like a radar screen, with green and red alternately wiping in a circle across its face. According to the museum, the light was retired from active duty in 1982 only because colorblind people couldn't tell if it was green or red. Wow. Oh, wow. So if it, was, if it weren't for those people, <laughs> this light would still be working yeah, you're right. yeah, on the street. So <laughs> just, I'm, I want you to be aware of what you did to history. Yes, you people with your colorblindness. God, the nerve. <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue on. Let's look at the world's oldest running hotel receiving guests for 1,300 years. Wow. The phrase, old is gold, is personified through the Hoshi Ryokan in Japan, which qualifies to be the oldest hotel in the world. It has a history of 1,300 years of operations, facilitated through 46 generations of family ownership. 46 generations. Wow. Um, that's keeping the business in the family. Also. The hotel is complete with a restaurant, spa, guest rooms, a garden, a theater, a hall, a festival foyer, and a couple of other units whose functions are only familiar to the Japanese. All right, and that's cool. So we've got two left. Here we go. All right. uh, the world's oldest running car that was built in 1884. Oh. A steam-powered car billed as the oldest car in the world that still runs was sold in October 2011 at a Hershey, Pennsylvania auction for $4.6 million. The car had been built in France in 1884, about a year before Gottlieb Daimler and Carl Benz built their first experimental gasoline-powered cars. I'm fascinated by uh, by steam power, steam locomotives, of course, the steam yeah. car that we just had a look at. It, or, you know, um, that, that sort of technology, uh, steam ships. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by by that mode of transportation. It's, mm -hmm. it's just... I, it's oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's it incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to our last old thing that still works. The world's oldest still working cinema. First opened in 1909. In 2009, Sketsin, Poland's pioneer 1909 cinema, the oldest continuously operating cinema in the world, celebrated its 100th birthday. The Helios Welt Kino Theater, as the cinema was called at the time, opened its doors on September 26, 1909 with three films. And Norm, good luck with this. Der Kampf und den Globen, Pick und Pock, and Die Smargerskirsten, Der Breitengen. When a cinema ticket only cost two groschen. <laughs> you know, so back in the old days, you would do groschenries, right? <laughs> groschenries. Yeah, groschenries. So you'd go out and buy some food and go to the movies. Yeah, that's true. Uh, anyway, fascinating stuff uh, of those, those incredible things that, that, are, that are still around and still working today. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, wow, it's really, really eye-opening. Really is. cool. Yeah. All right, now it is time for another Meltdown Minute with Lou. Things fall apart, folks. First rule of nature. And back in the day, you could buy something that actually lasted you 20 or 30 or 40 years, but those days are gone, as we all know. And we're comfortable with that because now, cheaper goods, yada yada. I'm not honestly sure why we're comfortable with that, to be 100% honest. And the truth is, I understand the appeal and the attraction of gadgets and new stuff. Man, I'm all about the gadgets. I bought an app for my phone. All it does is pretend to be a lighter. That's it. I paid a buck for it and I didn't even think about it. That's amazing, I said. And I can't help but think that we're a little bit spoiled in terms of the choices that we now have to face. I can't imagine pilgrims being tormented by the same set of circumstances. With pilgrims it was more like, let's see, either we slaughter our fattest calf or I put my grandmother on a raft and send her out to sea. Enjoy your choices is what I'm saying. Thank you, Lou. And now for some meltdown, stupid stupidness. All right. So in today's stupid stupidness file, um, we're going to be looking at things that no longer work. All right. um, now these can be mechanical things. They can be concepts. They can be, um, I don't know, all kinds of things that used to be the thing at one point and are no longer the thing. And let's begin our list with Napster. 
Now, without Napster, something else would surely have popularized online file sharing, but credit where credit's due. Napster's meteoric turn of the century rise as the world's de facto peer-to-peer -peer internet client hastened the shift away from compact discs to ethereal digital tunes. The notion that your entire music collection might fit on a hard drive was unimaginable before Napster. Now, Napster's greatest strength, the unfettered exchange of anything, including copyright infringing songs and albums, eventually proved its Achilles heel, forcing it to shift to a subscription-based model that ultimately drove it to bankruptcy. Mm. Unfortunate, but I remember Napster. Yep. I remember it. Uh, I never used it. I used uh, similar things, maybe. Right. Maybe I tried to. I don't know. I never used Napster. I, it makes me, you know, I, 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 I long for the days of record stores. I'm oh, yeah, yeah. Never they still have them. They still have them. Well, they still do. Still, That's still true. Vinyl. Yeah. Shake Records in Ottawa. Do you remember them? Yes. They were. That was great. I love going to Shake Records. Yeah. Yeah. All right, <laughs> uh, let's keep going. The uh, the next thing, now this one is still around, but it's not around uh, in the same context as it was when it first came out, and that is BlackBerry. Mm, right. So before the iPhone, there was the BlackBerry, or CrackBerry, as the device's obsessed users affectionately referred to them. These iconic devices were many users' first smartphones, able to connect to the internet, send and receive email, and chat with one another over the company's BlackBerry Messenger, or BBM, service. And they were everywhere. BlackBerry exists today only as a shadow of its former self, but the company's devices paved the way for the super-powered smartphones we carry around today. And that must suck, you know, to be the ones to, 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 to invent something like BlackBerry, like right. Napster, only to have someone else come and just blow them out of the water because the, theirs is much better. Yeah. I mean, there's something, there is something to be said about being first, but I think there's even more to be said about the one that lasts. That's the way it works. That's how it evolves. People say, hey, right, that's that's how a plane flies or that's how you know the BlackBerry works. Well, wait a minute, now we can do this. Now so, we can do this and make yeah. it better, yep. That's why we have museums. One of the reasons why we have museums. <laughs> Another place to find old things at work. <laughs> yeah. um, here we go. Let's uh, continue with AOL, America Online. Yeah. Remember them? Yes, indeed. It's hard to look at what America Online was and not wonder what it could have been. The first internet service provider to capture the country's attention, it began to gobble up content on the web much in the same way that Facebook and Google are doing today. And AOL's instant messenger platform was, arguably, a precursor to every messaging app currently in operation. But eventually the company was both clotheslined by subscribers departing for faster ISPs and undercut by free internet services like Microsoft's Hotmail and Google's Gmail. So again, another example of someone coming along and doing it better mm -hmm. uh here we go i had one of these maybe you had one of these the palm pilot no i didn't have one of those i know of what you speak though yeah i uh, used to use it for calendars and i used to use it for notes and and exactly what i use my iphone for today right. the first mainstream product to fit our digital lives into our pockets the original palm pilot pda which stands for personal digital assistant yeah. sold a million units in its first year alone which makes it hard to brand the device a failure that Palm was never able to convert the beachhead it established in mobile computing into a smartphone empire is one of the biggest tragedies in all of tech. Mm. And seriously, everybody I knew had one. And, you know, the little, it was a little Palm Pilot. I probably still have it in my desk somewhere. And you pull the little, um, what do you call the stylus out? And you yeah. could tap, 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 tap. And you could check your calendar. And you could sync your calendar to your computer. And yeah. just much, much in the way that... That, that now iCloud does it like this. I don't yeah. even have to press a button. If I change something in my phone, it changes on my PC, which right. I love. Yeah. All right, uh, here's one. Uh, and a friend of mine actually ran out and bought one of these when they first came out and spent a fortune on it. The Betamax. <laughs> I owned one as well. Did you? Yeah. Okay. You've probably heard Betamax was better than VHS and only flopped because Sony fumbled its marketing. That's about half right. In truth, Betamax's technical bona fides were trifling, even to video files, and that, along with its higher price tag, made VHS the consumer no-brainer. Though its technical impact was nominal, Betamax's iconic role in the latter part of the 20th century's videotape format wars laid the notional groundwork for all the binary platform battles since. That's a sentence. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Uh, do you remember MySpace? Um, uh, MySpace, yes, I do. Okay. MySpace was the place where web stars are born and music and film careers are launched, as Time wrote when we named it one of the 50 best websites of 2006. But this once king of social media was overtaken by rival Facebook around 2009. What happened? 
Some observers blame bureaucratic morass after News Corp purchased MySpace's parent company for $580 million in 2005. Facebook, which now boasts 1.86 billion monthly active users, likely learned from MySpace's demise, staying quick to adapt to changing user tastes and remaining unafraid to pay big sums to gobble up potential rivals like Instagram, which it acquired for $1 billion in 2012. Okay, let's continue. Uh, the Google Glass. Do you remember? It oh, kind of yeah, looked like yeah, this, yeah. but it just had a, okay. had a thing there. It's kind of coming back to me. Yeah. Well, few gadgets have debuted with as much buzz as Google Glass. The smart spectacles the search giant unveiled in 2012. From its flashy introduction demo that featured skydivers streaming their jump through the device to a spread in Vogue, Glass had possibly one of the most hyped gadget launches of all time. But all for naught. Google shelved the product in 2015, though it's still being used in some professional applications. The headset's high price tag of $1,500 and concerns about privacy kept it from going mainstream. Mm. And I think there you go. Uh, number one is the price tag, $1,500. Not everybody can afford yeah. $1,500. I mean, I look at some of the prices of the, uh, of the smartwatches, and one of the reasons I won't get one is because they're just too damn expensive. Mm. So here's, a, here's one that I've always liked. The Segway. Oh, yeah. Now, perhaps no gadget evokes the early turn of the century like the Segway, a personal motorized scooter that riders control by leaning into one direction or another. Designed as a revolutionary new transportation option, Segways have largely been relegated to the realm of the mall cop and tour group. <laughs> but for whatever reason, technologists never tire of trying to replace the well-proven movement method of walking around. The great hoverboard craze of 2015 and 16 can trace its origins directly to this stand-up scooter. All right, uh, two more left. Let's look at QR codes. Do you know what those oh, are? I, I sort of those blotchy oh. things you aim your phone at oh, them. Of course. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. QR codes sound like a genuinely useful idea. Barcode-like symbols that smartphone users could scan for more information about some real-world object, be it a movie poster or a museum exhibit. The idea. It's easier to scan a code than it is to type along an unwieldy URL into a mobile internet browser. Though it remains popular abroad, the technology never caught on in the US, perhaps because QR codes tend to be ugly and jarring. <laughs> and they are, they're, they kind of, you know, it's a, uh, they look like alien uh, messages. <laughs> and, and you know, in this country, we, we don't, do not like aliens. No. Well, no Outer I space like aliens. aliens. Yeah. I like aliens. So do I. Yeah. So <laughs> Jeff and I are the only ones that love aliens. Uh, for all for all you know, we are aliens. Uh, yes, I, that could be true. Okay, our last one, uh, things that no no longer work, and and I used to use this all the time was MapQuest. Oh yeah. Long ago, MapQuest was one of the best options around for getting driving directions before you set off on your road trip. While it still exists, it was the number two mapping service in the U.S. as of 2015. It's been largely outmoded by Google Maps, Apple Maps, and other smartphone-based GPS services that rendered pre-printed driving directions obsolete. Still, the service was many users' first foray into getting driving directions from the internet, leading to the much improved services we enjoy today. I think what, what, it, what it is with Google Maps and some of these other things is that they do the majority of the work for you. Yeah. And because of the location services on your phone, if Google Maps, you know, if you allow it to know where you are, then it, it'll, it'll, you know, the second you pop an address and where you want to go, it knows everything, mm. you know, how, how to get there, how long it's going to take to get there, and blah, blah, blah. So it's, yeah, MapQuest could never do that. No. So it, it wasn't really user friendly in that way. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of uh, Only When It Works. And uh, uh, look at that. We're at the end of the episode, Jeff, and you and I are still functioning. So we're we still working. <laughs> and hopefully we'll still be working when we see you again next week. So until then, have a great week. Bye. See you later. Bye.